Jesus is the king. Amen. And he invites us to participate in his kingdom. The ways of his kingdom are far different than what you're used to. We were talking in Sunday school this morning. Someone cuts you off in traffic. What is the normal instinct? Raise a fist or maybe a finger. <laughs> Something comes out of your mouth. I mean, these are the normal gut instinct reactions. That's a little too loud. Gut instinct reactions. And Jesus says, I saved you from all that. I brought you into my kingdom. You are my children, and I expect you to behave as such. Now, here's, we, here's how we are in the human realm. We get a little bit of information, and we think we know it all. You know, you maybe watch a plumbing thing on television. Honey, I can, I can plumb the whole house. Uh, what's the saying? You give, them a, you give them a rope and they want to be a cowboy. And, and, and God's saying, your whole life, you walked in the kingdom of this world. And I want to introduce you to my kingdom. And you don't know how to do this. Let me teach you how it works. That's what he's saying to us. Let me show you how it works. Because every instinct within you wants to do it the old way. But my word will lead you in a whole different direction. His word is powerful. And we have a very real enemy. He's called Satan and he hates you. You are created in the image of God. Male and female, he created you. You look like your daddy. Satan gets a good look at you. I hate you. I hate you. I mean, we put people on pedestals. Some are better looking, some are more talented, and we tend to give them more credence, more praise. Every human being created in the image of God, none better than another. All of them have a distinct purpose. And God is saying, look, I want to call you out of the world system that gives accolades to certain people for the way they look and the way they act, and I want to pull you out of all of that, and I want to bring you into my kingdom and show you that I love you. I want to show you how much I love you, that I'll be willing to protect you from the enemy that is trying to destroy your life. He was cast out of my realm. He's down there in the earth, and he has all kinds of ploys and attacks to try to get to you. One of them we witness on a grand scale, as Lillian brought up already this morning, General Davis Petraeus. At 60 years of age, he makes a decision to get cozy with the woman that helps him write his own biography. How, how could that happen? How could she, she listen to him? She was helping him write his story. Ladies, let me give you an understanding of how us men work. Men, we love for our story to be told and for the women around us to like our story. Men, isn't that true? That's why we repeat our stories. Because they sound good to us. And the wife said, you already told me that. That's not what we want to hear. We don't want to hear that we already told you that. We want to hear, tell it again, honey. <laughs> tell, tell me that story again. There's something inside of us that, that needs that assurance. General Petraeus is sharing his story with this woman. And she says, I like this. I like this. I like this. And the boundaries began to be blurred. His wife already lived the story with him for some 38 years. She's saying, I don't want to hear the story. Tell it to somebody else. And so he found somebody to tell the story to. And the enemy said, ha, ha, ha. 
The boundaries are down. They're blurred. I have access. And I will embarrass this man publicly. And so he did. Through sexual immorality, sexual perversion, adultery, and lust. All the same camp. And the enemy uses this to lure people away from their kingdom way of living. It used to be a male problem, but we're living in a society where uh, female, females are engaging in just as much pornography as the men. It's at an addictive level to the tune of multi-billion dollar industry of sex trafficking and pornography. Because pornography leads you down this road of wanting to act out what it is that you've seen. And now it's for sale everywhere. Male and female, they're participating. And we've got to ask ourselves, is the church, are people sitting in the pews, are we attacked by the enemy the same way General Petraeus was? Are people sitting in our pews, hands raised, participating in the offering, giving praise and glory to God, reading their Bibles, but are they attacked by the stronghold of sexual perversion? And I would say yes. From the pulpit to the pew, to the choir, to the board, people are attacked by the enemy. And we're going to look at that this morning. Would you turn first to the book of Jude? Right before the book of Revelation is the book of Jude. Look at what verse 7 says. It's going to talk about two ancient cities. One of them by the name of Sodom and one of them by the name of Gomorrah. Now who here can tell me what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Why were they destroyed? Sexual perversion was the problem in those communities. And God said, he told Abram, his servant, I'm going to destroy those cities. His nephew Lot lived there. And so Abraham is saying, God, don't destroy the city. If I could find 50 righteous, would you spare it? God says, yeah, go ahead, try to find 50. Abraham knew he couldn't find 50. It was a city, two cities that were completely evil. He says, uh, how about 40, God? If I find 40. And what does he finally do? He talks God down, talks him down, talks him down, talks him down. Can't find any. The angelic visitors are sent to rescue Lot. Lot tries to tell his family, let's get out of here. God's going to destroy this city because of its sexual perversion. And the reality was, what do we know about Lot's wife? She had her eyes over her shoulder looking with longing eyes back to the city. And she's turned to a pillar of salt. Why? Because her eyes revealed what her heart really wanted. And her heart wanted what was in that city. But Lot just kept on trucking. Get me out of here. Get me out of here. So much to the fact that Peter tells us that his righteous soul was tormented, living day in and day out in that environment of sexual perversion. His righteous soul was tormented, living in that environment. So Jude tells us Sodom and Gomorrah serve as an example. What does it say? As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What does God think about sexual immorality? What does this verse say? These cities that we can read about in the book of Genesis are to teach us something. We should open our Bibles as students of the Word of God and say, oh, look at that, that's a nice little story. No way! 
We should read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and watch how God destroys it because it serves as an example of what's going to happen to individuals who live in sexual immorality. They will go on to eternal judgment and be expelled from God's kingdom and live in eternal damnation, the fire of hell. Do you get that? And so the enemy of our soul, if he could distract us, if he could get us from to stop doing the work of the kingdom of God, he will try everything he can. He hates you, he hates God, and he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to get you to live a sexually immoral life. I want to try to get you to live in lust and perversion. What does America look like on the landscape? Just driving into any large city. What, what greets your eyes, ladies and gentlemen? Drive with me into New York City. What, what hits you? I mean, especially us who live out in the country. I mean, what, what hits you? Signs. I mean, it slaps me in the face. There's like this gigantor woman in her underwear selling guests jeans. <laughs> My quick mind says, she's not wearing jeans. <laughs> she's naked. And you say to yourself, what is that? Welcome to the city. Welcome to the United States of America. Welcome to a country that participates in sexual immorality, sexual perversion, lust, and disgusting things that are vile in the nostrils of God. Not to mention, I mean, I, I've been on the other side. My wife and I have gone to India, and, and we've met the young girls who are sold into the sex traffic industry. We, we've looked into their hollow eyes, where they've been just simply tossed into it, uh, made to take off their clothes, made to, to pose in, in, in sexy positions, and they're going to be put on the Internet for guys' eyes to look at. And, and, and the men are thinking, oh, she's enjoying this. No, she's not. We've met her. She's being used like a piece of meat to sell something that ends in eternal damnation. And, and I wouldn't be so concerned except that to the tune of multi-billion dollars, the largest industry on the face of earth is this human trafficking and sexual immorality and the abuse of both girls and boys and men and women. And God says, I can't stand it. This verse in Jude, look what it says Again, as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them in similar manner to these have, can you read it out loud with me, given themselves over to sexual immorality. This verse tells us that the perversion can be given into an outward stimuli that draws you away from kingdom righteous living to participate in sexual immorality. It can be given into. Where does this come from? Where does the lure and the temptation really come from? Would you go to James? Just turn back a few books to the book of James. You'll go through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 1st and 2nd Peter, and then you'll find yourself in James to the left. James chapter 1, 
starting in verse 12. Look, you know I tell you this stuff because I love you. Women will come to me and tell me my husband looks at porn. It's on the computer. He doesn't know that I know. What should I do? Do you realize how heart-wrenching that is? Girlfriends will tell me their boyfriends are looking at stuff they shouldn't. And I'm not talking about people that you don't know. They're in the church. And I love you enough to bring it up to say that's a stronghold. The enemy's trying to rip you off. He's trying to destroy the kingdom of God from the inside out. And I want to stand with you and say, this can be defeated. Amen. This stronghold, along with every other one, because as far as I'm concerned, this one's no more disgusting than any other. John brought up unforgiveness this morning in Sunday school as a stronghold. That's just as disgusting to me as this. When, when someone holds bitterness in their heart and unforgiveness, that's disgusting. And it stops you from living the kingdom of God. And sexual immorality is part of your lifestyle. The marriage bed is, is impure. That's disgusting. And we need to bring it up. Because God wants to heal. And I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm here to rescue people. I, I want to pull them out of the, the smoke of hell. I, I want to, before God comes, I want to smell like the smoke of hell rescuing people out saying you don't want to go there that's the trappings of hell that's the strongholds of darkness I don't want you living there and as an agent of God a called individual I say I know what the devil's up to and I'm just here to tell you what's up no condemnation just here to point out James chapter 1 verse 12 blessed is the man who endures temptation you need to underline that because you will Endure temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. When you get to the book of Revelation, what is the word to the churches? He who overcomes. He who overcomes. The devil's going to throw stuff in your way and you need to hurdle. You need to practice your hurdling skills. Get up over that thing. Rise above it. Overcome, win over temptation, because you'll receive a crown of life. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. What is the entry point? Well, pastor, the heart wants what the heart wants. Appetite. Appetite. I, I got to have it. I've got to have it. Pastor, you don't understand. I've got to have it. The entry point is in your heart. He's saying, you're, God's not tempting you. He didn't put beautiful woman, women on the earth for you to ogle and drool over. He said, that problem is already in your heart. And the enemy walks right in that open door and says, I've got a lot more to show you if you're interested. Oh, do I have all kinds of things to show you if you're interested? And a lot of us, like zombies, show me, show me more. I want more. A little used to be good enough. But now a little turns into a little bit more. And pretty soon, you have an addiction. So much so that there are men that have stood on the hill of Congress, stood at the platform, spoke onto the microphone, 
and said pornography needs to come with a label that this inflicts upon you an addiction stronger than heroin. And it does. Scientists have figured out when those images come into your mind, they are burned into the brain. And your mind can't stop thinking about it. It's in there. It's in the deep tissue. And it stays there. And it could have been 20 years ago. You're married now. You're trying to be intimate with your wife. And all of a sudden, guess what pops into your mind? 20 years later. An image of something that you should have never seen. And it's stored in there. The enemy knows this. And he says, if I can just keep that banging around in their brain, if I can just keep that banging around in their spirit, I can keep bringing it up, and I can keep bringing it up. And he's put a stronghold inside of you, and he keeps having access to the st same stronghold. And you've got to stand up and say, I'm a child of the king. My mind has been washed with the word of God. Those images are no longer mine. They're washed out in the word of God. Amen. But as long as you entertain them and allow them to remain a fortress inside of you, they are a stronghold. They are a place for the enemy to encamp and they will stay alive. It's bitter and it's disgusting, but it's the enemy's way in. So how does this perversion or lust actually stay there to keep you trapped? Would you go to Romans? I want you to see this. Romans chapter 1. Perversion can be given into. It is a temptation of the enemy. The temptation comes from lusts and desires that are already in our heart. The enemy says, I have access, and I'm going to shoot that gap, and I'm going to destroy you. How does it have that? How does it keep that alive? Romans chapter 1, starting in, well, we're going to just read verse 18. For the wrath of the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And there's the answer. The suppression of truth. Here's the real battle. That image is bouncing around in your mind. You begin to entertain thoughts. Those thoughts begin to move into actions. And then give birth to sin, as James would describe it. As you put action to the thoughts that are already banging around in your brain. How can that stay alive? I'm a Christian. How can that stay in there? Romans is saying that the wrath of God is reserved against people who suppress the truth. So here's what's going on. You got saved. You're reading your Bible. You've turned your life over to Christ. Satan has a stronghold in there. He's bouncing thoughts around. He's showing you images that are not proper and they're banging around inside your mind and the Holy Spirit says, take this truth. Take truth. Go to the Word right now. And the other side of you says, the Word? Uh, I, want, I want what my, my mind is thinking about right now. Gentlemen, when your motor gets running, I'm talking to the men, when your motor gets running, do you want to read a book? Come on, be honest. Sexually speaking, when your motor gets revving, who wants to go read a book? But the very truth of God will say to you, there's things bouncing around in your brain right there now that don't belong there. Go to my word. And you're either going to obey the Holy Spirit or you're going to suppress truth and say, I don't want that. And as long as your heart wants it, the stronghold remains. 
You say, Pastor, is all of that going on in my mind? In a millisecond. The battle is happening in your mind in milliseconds. You're making decisions so fast to either side with the work of God or to side with the work of the enemy. And if we push truth down and say, shut up, I want what I want. Just shut up, I know what's right, but I want what I want. As long as we suppress truth, the stronghold remains. So what does Jesus have to say about this? John chapter 8. The Gospel of John chapter 8. There's you. You have that proverbial angel on one shoulder, a demon on the other. The demon's reminding you. Remember those images we saw? Let's go after this thing. Let's, let's live in this. It'll feel good, I promise. And on the other shoulder, you have, don't do that. Don't participate in that. Here's what Satan doesn't want you to know. John chapter 8, starting in verse number 31. And Jesus said to the, those Jews who believed in him, what do we have here? Who's he talking to? Do they believe or don't they? We have believers. We have people that believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? If you abide in me and my word in you, you are my disciples indeed. Are you a disciple? Let me ask you that. Have you put the word inside of you? Do you abide in the word? And does the word abide in you? That means when the enemy comes in, uh, how, do, how does Isaiah say it? When the enemy comes in like a flood, what is God going to do? He'll raise a standard against the enemy. That's the flag of war. All right, so the enemy's coming in. He's trying to dissuade you. He's trying to distract you to work the kingdom of God. God raises a standard. Boom, his word. And the word of God should rise up within you to defeat those evil thoughts. But if you don't live in the word, guess what you don't have? You've got no recourse. You've got nothing to stand on. You've got nothing to fight with. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. The only offensive weapon we've been given. It is the word of God. So if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know what? The truth. And the truth shall make you free. There's a difference about, between knowing about truth and living in truth. When you live in the truth and the word of God and you understand that his kingdom is a kingdom that will protect you and will not allow you to go into evil, but he will protect you he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High rests in the shadow of the Almighty. When you stay in the confines of the kingdom, the enemy does not have the access. The Word of God abides in you. It's living inside of you. It's living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive inside of you. The enemy comes. He's trying to dissuade you, and you say, uh-uh, I'm a child of God. The Word of God says such and such. And you begin to strike down the work of the enemy. Why? Because you live in the community of the kingdom of God. Jesus is your king. And he stands with his arms crossed behind you. The enemy tries to get access. Looking around. Going around the perimeter. Trying to find access. Jesus, your elder brother, stands above you and says, I don't think so. I don't think so. That door has been closed those images have been washed by my word. You try to bring up the past, my servant speaks the word. Come on, are you alive this morning? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Protecting yourself from the, from the, the wiles, the wickedness of the enemy. What's the solution? 
Would you go to Galatians? Galatians chapter 5. Jesus gives you truth. This truth makes you free. And then Paul speaks about this. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 7. Try to throw you all a, a rope. Climb up the rope. Get out of the fire. Get out of temptation. Get out of what the enemy's trying to do to you. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Galatians 5, look at verse 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Isn't that a great question? I mean, I can, I can just see all of you. You're on the track. You're running that narrow road with Christ. You're going. And the enemy comes and bam, and you're on the ground. And I'm standing over you saying, what happened? What happened here? Who, who hindered you from obeying the truth? The truth makes you free. Who stopped you? Who stopped you? What's the obvious answer? Everybody wants to blame. Well, Satan did it. Well, what's really going on? Satan did this to me. No, you were already thinking that way. You were already had your eyes on that. If your eyes were on Christ and he, and he Satan, is trying to get you to look over there, you say, uh-uh, I'm with Jesus. Get away from me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. In his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Look over there. No. I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. There's nothing over there for you. It's a narrow path for a reason. There's nothing to the right. There's nothing to the left for you. His kingdom is straight ahead of you. Satan has his tactics. They're all over the place. Who hindered you? Verse 8. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. It doesn't come from him who called you. Who's it coming from? From both sides of the narrow path, Satan has his minions. Look over here. Look over here. It'll be better, I promise. You have a voice over here. Look over here. Look over here. Just trying to get a powerful child of God off track. And you're either going to look, oh, I want that. Oh, I got to have that. Oh, I got to have that. Oh. Come on. Come on. Aren't we better than that? Aren't we, aren't we better than that? Jump down to verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What is lust? It's desire. It's cravings. It's longing for what is forbidden. There's a longing in your heart for what is forbidden. How do you defeat that longing in your heart for what is forbidden? For what you should not participate in. How do you stop that? And Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're singing the song, Come Lord Jesus, come. And while we're singing that, I'm thinking of this, this other song. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come, in thy strength and thy power. Come, 
in that own special way. I'm thinking, I, you, me, we need the power of the Holy Spirit or we're going to give in to that stuff. We need the unction, the outpouring. I don't care if there's doctrines that say that the Holy Spirit's not for today. That's a lie from the pit of hell because the only way we can defeat the lust of the flesh is to walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. He says, I will give you my spirit. Look what he says. Verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. How many of you say, I've experienced that? It's like a stinking war going on. And I can't seem to do the right thing. I'm always laying on the ground, the victim. I want to get up for crying out loud, and I want to be a victor for once. How many of you, that's, yeah. Yeah, I want to be a victor. I want to stop laying on the ground, a victim to all this stuff. I want to be a victor. Verse 18. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery. General Petraeus, what did he do? He walked into adultery. Why? Because he wasn't led by the Spirit. I don't care how many stripes you have on your shoulders. I don't care how many medals are hanging off your chest. You cannot live a life of honor without the Holy Spirit. You can only go so far in the eyes of man, and one day you will trip. One day you will fall. Everybody might know about it, or maybe only one person might know about it. It doesn't matter. You will fail. You must follow the Holy Spirit. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that the Holy Spirit is inside of you, is love, agape, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing, there's no boundary. There's no law. You want love? Take a whole bunch. You want to defeat pornography? Love your spouse this way. With the love of God, seeing your spouse as a child of God as well. We used to ask this in Bible college and different guys were going to go out on a date. And we would say, we who maybe didn't have a date that night, where are you taking God's daughter tonight? Oh, did that always spoil the date. <laughs> where are you taking God's daughter tonight? What are you going to do with God's daughter on your date? Boy, did that snap them into line. What are you going to be doing with God's daughter? Are you going to defile God's daughter tonight? God's watching you. Yeah, I like to do that. I, I want to be that guy. What are you doing with God's daughter? Are you going to live by the flesh? We're going to live by the spirit. Keep reading with me. Those who are Christ, verse 24 have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Do we know at all what that means in this generation of Christianity? Or is it just a religious game? Clock in, clock out. I did my church time. God has to be smiling today. I mean, have we crucified the flesh with its passions and desires and said, you're dead? Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Would you turn to Colossians? Galatians, Ephesians, then Philippians, then Colossians. If you belong to Christ, you will willingly submit to be crucified 
to the flesh. It looks something like this. Here's my altar before God. God, it's a nightmare out there. The images, they're everywhere. God, how am I going to make it? Everywhere I look, there's the flesh. God, I'm going to need your spirit. My flesh is weak. God, I know. God, I can't do this, can I? I die to myself. Take, take it. Take these passions, God. I die to myself. God, take them. I die to myself. I don't want to live that life any longer. I surrender all. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, have you ever gotten gut honest with God and had one of those soliloquies? God, I can't do this. And he says, thank you. You can't do this. Now I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit and you will be victorious over this. And now what I see, because God has taught me a thing or two about this particular issue, when those images are all around, God says, look at her eyes. Tell me what you see. And he takes me right to the streets of India, and it's the same hollow eyes. And then I, what do I do? I begin to intercede for a woman I don't even know. Why? Because she's being abused by a system that pays big money for sex. There's a person behind that image that's created in the image of God, not to be ogled by men and women, but to recognize that they've been stolen, they've been enticed, they've been ripped off by the world, and God lets me see the images with brand new eyes. What about the real people that cross your path? Get your head turning. The Holy Spirit has a recipe for that too. That's not yours. That's not yours. So quit looking at it as if it is yours. Holy Spirit has a way of keeping you in line. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 1. I promise I won't keep you all day. But this is important. If then you were raised with Christ, where are we raised with Christ to, John? We are seated, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Can someone shout amen? amen? That's what happens when you give your heart to the Lord. If then we are raised to that stature, that we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. You get up every day, I'm going to seek the things that are above. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because if your eyes and your heart go wondering for something else, you're not raised with Christ. If you still have longing eyes for the world, James says to you, adulterer, adulteress. You're cheating on God with the world. If you're seated with Christ, raised with him, then think on those things. Verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Do you get it? You're dead. So when your friends say, come on, we used to do this all the time. That guy's dead. I am now hidden in Christ. I am a new creation. I, I had that very thing happen. My friends said, what happened to you? What are you, one of those Jesus freaks now? That's right. I am now hidden in Christ. 
I am a brand new creation, one that never existed before. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Praise God. Therefore, if that's you, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Praise God. Paul, and I would argue with him, just because you said the prayer to ask Jesus in your heart doesn't mean that there isn't stuff still banging around in there. And he says, bring that stuff to the altar and say, slay it. Slay it, God, I'm done with it. Slay this stuff, get it off of me. Kids are quite simple in this. I've told you about Victoria. She hates anything that crawls, wiggles, squirms. Spider drops down from the ceiling from her shoulder. Get it! Get it! Dad! That's a beautiful image to me. Takes me right to the word. The enemy's coming. Dad! Dad, get it off! Get it off of me! I want my eyes on you. I don't want this. Get it off. Guess who will be there? Abba Father. Here Daddy is ready to come to the rescue. Who dares try to defile my child? Who dares to try to, try to knock my child off course? Who dares? Then you don't have to fight. Because God will go before you. He'll be behind you. He'll be your side guard. He'll speak to his angels concerning you. Come on, are you alive? I mean, I'm talking about walking the ways of the kingdom or like old blue eyes, I did it my way. <laughs> What's it going to be? What's it going to be? Live, listen to this, live by the Spirit and you will walk by the Spirit. Catch the imagery of what he's saying. The Holy Spirit is saying to you, follow me. Look, you don't know what you're doing. You don't even know where I'm going. John chapter 3 says that very clearly. The Spirit of God is like the wind. You don't know where it comes from or where it's going. But you got to follow. I mean, that's uncharted waters for most of us. He's going to go a direction unpredictable to you. And you've got to say, are you sure, God? Are you sure? And he says, I'm God. Don't second guess me. So if we are living by the Spirit, allowing him to call the shots, then we can walk by the Spirit and not gratify the lust of the flesh. It's a simple recipe for success in the kingdom of God. The world may look at you and think, what a loser. Who cares? Who cares what they think? I care about what he thinks. Because I'll stand before him one day. I won't stand before them. So when I stand before Christ, like you, I want to say, God, I did it. I did it the way you wanted me to do it. I followed the lead of your spirit, and I watched, I watched as the enemy couldn't get access, couldn't get into me, couldn't get into my heart because you gave me authority and power. You gave me strength and you gave me divine protection. God, I want to keep walking in that. But I want to tell you, don't get a big head about this.
Because you can be walking, 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 and the enemy is going to be right up here maybe and try to get you again. But you keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Would you bow your heads? Look, it's real simple. After hearing this today, you say to yourself, I want to crucify the flesh. I want to be filled with God's spirit and I want to be done with lust. You're sitting here today and you're saying, that's me. I, I want to die to myself. I want to stop this fleshly desire stuff and I want to live by the spirit. Are you here? Just raise your hand and say, that's me. Yeah, God bless you. God bless you all over this house. Praise God. Father, you've brought an awareness to this church today about the traps of the enemy, the access points. And you've shown us the way out. And I give you praise and I give you glory and I thank you for those who are responding to the lead of your spirit and saying, I want to be done, done with that. I want to crucify the flesh. I want to come before you, God, to be done with all of this stuff. And I pray, Father, that you would give them the victory. I pray, Father, that we would hear testimonies in the days to come that you are giving your children the victory over the lust of the flesh. And, Father, they will rejoice. They will leap for joy recognizing that you are the one that has provided the victory and you are the one that sets them free. And I ask this accomplished in the mighty name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen and amen. Praise God. We'll see you back here tonight. We're going to be talking. Let me find the verse for you so you can dwell on this and pray on this this afternoon. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. We're going to be speaking on this tonight. 